thank you very much for coming to listen. It's really a privilege to be here kicking off the Discovery Days talks and it's an exciting program ahead. So this is my title and this is my work title, Professor of Molecular and Genetic Dermatology. So it is a bit of a mouthful and I thought I'd start by explaining uh, what it entails in real life. So I spend um, one to two days a week working as a doctor in Nine Wells Hospital. Um, and as uh, Pete just explained, I have specialist clinics for adults and children, uh, spe specifically with eczema, but all of the skin diseases as well. So that's one to two days a week. For the rest of my three to four days a week, I'm based uh, at the medical school and I run a genetics research laboratory in the School of Medicine. The reason I do these two jobs is really because my clinical work inspires my research. It gives me questions that I have to answer. These are questions that I find myself and questions that come from patients. And conversely, my research really aims to inform my clinical work with the aim of improving care for patients in the longer term. So these two roles are both challenging but very much complementary. So what is eczema? Well, if you read in the textbooks, it says it's an itchy, inflammatory skin condition. It often starts in childhood, but it can um, affect many adults. It looks very different in different people. Sometimes it feels like it's not one disease. It's such a wide variety of appearances. And one classic feature of eczema is that it comes and goes. And this can be encouraging when it goes away and disappointing when it comes back. And it's something that patients really struggle with. So again, if you read in a textbook, it says eczema uh, is a spongiotic dermatitis. And this describes what it looks like under the microscope. In some ways, it looks like a sponge. So this is a section of normal skin. So a tiny sample of skin looked at through the microscope. And you can see the upper layer of skin is the epidermis, and deeper beneath that is the dermis. And if you compare this to a sample of skin um, from a patient with eczema, you can see the features that supposedly make it look like a sponge. So the purple dots are the nuclei of the white blood cells which move into the skin and start to cause inflammation. The whiter areas between the skin cells contain water, and this is, these are spaces between the cells that develop when the skin becomes inflamed. And then the surface of the skin down the microscope shows a dry, scaly change. You can see it's thicker than the surface of the normal skin. And again, this is what you can see when you look at um, skin with the naked eye with eczema, and it's just more clearly seen down the microscope. So why is eczema important? Whenever I apply for funding to do my research, the first paragraph is always, eczema is a very important disease because it's the sort of thing that people um, can assume doesn't really have an impact. It's just your skin. You can take it for granted when it's working well. But when eczema occurs, the main problem is that it's very itchy. And when you see an image like this, you can imagine it's very uncomfortable. The child or the adult can't sleep. It's difficult to concentrate. Even sitting still in school or work is difficult. It can be painful when the eczema really flares up and gets infected. You can imagine it's embarrassing. People often feel able to comment about skin conditions, whereas if you had a heart condition or a lung condition, it's easier to hide. Eczema is also very expensive. On a personal level, patients and families uh, spend a lot of time caring for eczema. And on an NHS level, it's um, a huge drag on our resources. More than 25% of my new uh, ch childhood cases in the dermatology clinic have eczema. It's a, it's a very expensive condition. And importantly, we're, we're recognizing more and more that eczema is not just a skin condition. So we know that if you start with inflamed skin like this, it can progress into the other so-called atopic or allergic conditions. And these include asthma, hay fever, and food allergies. And again, increasingly, we're recognizing that eczema can affect the brain and the way that um, the brain functions. So we know in childhood, some eczema cases can be associated with ADHD. And in childhood or adulthood, depression can be a side effect or a, or a, um, a result of severe eczema. And the other very important thing about eczema is that it's so common. And it seems to have been becoming more common 
over recent decades. So if we look back to the 1960s, about 50, about 5% of um, primary school age children had eczema. By the 1980s, this had more than doubled. And a survey that I did myself in my early research in the north of England showed that in 2008, about one in four school children had eczema. A lot of eczema resolves later in childhood, so looking into adulthood, still about one in 10 adults in the UK can have a form of eczema. So on a, on a population basis, it is a huge burden. Internationally, it's interesting to note that UK comes near the top of eczema prevalence. And the reasons behind this, why we have so much eczema within our country, are not really well understood. So what causes eczema? This is a question I'm, answer, I'm asked quite frequently, and it's very difficult to answer. There isn't a simple answer. Really, because eczema isn't caused by one thing, it's many things working together that result in this dry skin, the itchiness, and inflammation. So what are these many things? One of the most important things is how your skin is made. And this is controlled by your genetics, your DNA. And we know that the genetic makeup is very important in eczema because eczema runs strongly in families. Uh, if you have an identical twin with eczema, you've got about an 80% chance of having eczema yourself compared to a non-identical twin where the chance is about 20%. And it's, it's one of the advantages within eczema that it runs in families so families can understand each other, but it's also a real challenge. Another thing that your genetics controls is the immune system and infection. So how your body responds to infection and inflammation is largely controlled by your genetic makeup, which again runs in your family. And the reason that eczema is increased in prevalence can't be explained by your genetics because we know that DNA can't have changed significantly over the last three to four decades. So this points to the importance of environmental factors in precipitating eczema. And we know that things that irritate the skin or things that we can be allergic to can trigger eczema in susceptible people. Precisely what it is within the environment that has brought about this increase in eczema um, is an area of research that I'm involved with. So trying to take this whole picture together, the unifying theme really is that the skin barrier becomes leaky. So a very important function of your skin is to keep outside the body what should be outside um, and not allow things to get in that shouldn't get in. Your skin also holds inside everything that should remain inside your body. And if this fails, the skin becomes leaky. And the, the importance of the skin barrier has really been emphasized by genetic studies that have been done here in Dundee. This one specific gene, filaggrin, is very important in maintaining the skin barrier. And when the filaggrin gene changes, the skin is leaky and the risk of eczema is greatly increased. And it makes sense logically. So when the skin barrier is leaky, water leaks out of your skin and this makes it more dry. Um, when the skin barrier is leaky, it allows allergens and irritants to enter into the skin, and this is what can set up the inflammation. And the thing about skin barrier damage is it becomes like a vicious cycle. So the more the barrier is faulty, the more inflamed it gets. So the more the barrier becomes leaky, the more the eczema flares up, and the vicious cycle um, perpetuates and worsens the condition. So, having told you what I've told you, I think you would all be able to guess a little bit, logically, how we treat eczema. So one of the important things is to try and avoid the triggers that we know can irritate the skin and set up inflammation. We also uh, encourage patients to use a lot of emollients or moisturizers to improve the skin barrier and add moisture and, and protect water in the skin. When those two simple things fail, the next step is to use steroid ointments or creams to tackle the inflammation that occurs in eczema. And the other thing we need to consider is whether to use antibiotics when the skin becomes infected, because eczema skin, when it's inflamed, is much more prone to becoming infected with bacteria or viruses. 
I've put avoiding triggers as the number one. And that is clearly a, um, a good aim. But, uh, prevention is better than cure. But avoiding triggers is a real challenge, given that identifying the triggers can be very difficult. Many people are fearful of using topical steroids because of the side effects that we know about. So the emphasis here is to use the right strength of topical steroid in the right amount at the right time. And we know that if, if we're able to do that, the right strength means that um, you won't be getting side effects. You get the benefits of treating the eczema whilst minimizing the side effects. And again, we're very aware that overuse of antibiotics in the community is a big problem in terms of inducing antibiotic resistance. So recent research has emphasized the importance of only using antibiotics when infection is present, not as a kind of a, a safety net when you're not sure. So if these steps fail, it's kind of a stepwise approach. The next treatment we consider are other drugs that can be used as creams or ointments to suppress the inflammation in the skin. In Dundee, we're a center of excellence for phototherapy, and we know that UVB and UVA wavelengths of light reduce inflammation in the skin. And for a subset of patients, this can be very beneficial for their eczema. And then the final step of treatment really is to consider tablets or injections, which suppress the whole body's immune system in an even more powerful way. But really, we do need better treatments. And I hear this loud and clear from my patients. They tell me they don't like their treatments. And as a doctor, this is, this is, this is uh, discouraging. <laughs> when your patients say the treatments are sticky, messy, horrible, um, it's not what you want to hear. Many patients are worried about the side effects. I share those concerns, and that's something that we take seriously. Patients clearly would like a cure. Um, and as yet, we know that the body can cure itself. Some cases of eczema resolve and never come back. But as a doctor, I'm not able to do that. And clearly, the need for more effective treatments is there. So this is where my research comes in. I aim to use genetics to understand the root cause of eczema to try and target treatments in a more directed way. And I'll tell you briefly about my, some of the techniques that I'm using in my lab. So a key technique is to grow artificial skin and we, and we make this from genuine human cells. And we use this model to test the genes that we know run in families that might be causing eczema. And I'll take you through now simply how we do this. So this is a skin sample that we were able to get um, from the surgeons in Ninewells Hospital with the patient's consent. And we dissect the skin to extract skin cells from the epidermis and also from the dermis. So the dermal skin cells, the lower layer, we grow these in jelly to make an artificial dermis. The keratinocytes, the cells from the upper layer, we grow in liquid. And we then calculate around 2 million cells are put on the surface of the jelly. Um, and these are there ready to make the upper layer of the skin. And the key step now is to lift the jelly out of the pink liquid, which is the liquid that nourishes it. You lift it out into the air. And this is the equivalent of a baby being born from the womb environment, which is, which is uh, very wet, to the external environment, which is essentially dry. And this air stimulates the, the skin cells to differentiate into the many layers that make it look like fully formed skin. And really, it is a very good model that looks very much like genuine skin. And the reason we go to all this trouble making artificial skin is because at this step here, we can interfere with the cells and switch on or switch off genes that we want to investigate as possible candidates for eczema. And here are some photos of the, the cells um, being stored. We store them in uh, liquid nitrogen to cryopreserve them. And here's the actual skin being made in the lab. And here's a close-up then. So as I've said, we interfere at key steps to switch off genes that we choose. We also need control samples so we can compare the differences caused by the gene being switched off with a sample that hasn't been interfered with. And looking closely, this little white circle is our artificial skin. And the control sample works very well. It really functions like normal skin. And you compare that to some of the genes that I've been investigating as possible candidates for eczema, 
Here the skin samples we can demonstrate are rather leaky. They allow water to escape, they're quite dry, and they allow dye to leak in through them. So these are not healthy skin and it appears uh, to have features of eczema. So why do I bother doing this? What is the hope for the future? I've shown you that we can switch genes on and off using skin cells in the laboratory. The next step is to match up these effects with proteins and we have world experts in Dundee for me to work with to do this. The next step after that is to screen uh, chemicals and again we've got a world leading drug discovery unit in Dundee to look for drugs that can start to repair the problems with the genes. And the final step is always to produce better treatments for patients. And this is the hope for the future. So if there are eczema patients in the audience, we're working on this, but be patient with us. It takes 10 or more years to go from a gene discovery to producing treatments. So please bear with the, the, the inadequate treatments that we have in the meantime. And I'd like to finish by acknowledging the team that I work with, the great people in Dundee, the inspirational patients that really make me do the research that I do, and of course the people that provide the funding for my research. And thank you all for listening. Thank you.